Dr. Darren Tam, who's going to be speaking about challenging the educational monopoly. Uh, Darren has spent over a decade teaching various mathematical concepts at a handful of colleges. Darren is currently teaching at New Hampshire Technical Institute and Southern New Hampshire University. He is the founder of Dr. Tapp's Mathematical Playgrounds, which bring concepts of arithmetic, geometry, and combinometrics. Huh? Combinatorics. Combinatorics to young people. Darren is also the co-host of Neocash Radio. And let's welcome Mr. Darren Tapp. Thank you, Scott. So, yes, uh, thank you for being here. So, uh, I'd like to talk about challenging the educational monopoly. Uh, thank you, Mara, for inviting me to speak today. So, uh, what I'd like to present in this 20 minutes is, uh, well, first a little bit about my background, and then some experiences I had teaching college, and uh, how that applies uh, to uh, basically a thought experiment about what math education might be uh, if it wasn't for the government and the government's influence over education. And then I'd like to share with you actions that I, that, that has uh, encouraged me to take. And I'd also like to talk about a little bit of the results and uh, I just have a short discussion about the future, uh, what, what might be in store in the future. So uh, I've had a, life, a lifelong love of math uh, with, with few exceptions. I've, I've, uh, I've always enjoyed studying math, and actually, as a high school student, I wanted to go into business. I wanted to trade stocks and make lots of money. And um, because I wanted to actually study more math, I decided not to go into business. I also wanted to avoid accounting, uh, which is not the type of math that really excited me. Uh, so I decided to study physics instead. So that was a crucial point in my life. And and then I, uh, after a physics degree, I ended up switching to math for a master's and PhD. There's a picture of me I found where, where I'm a little bit younger than I am now, and um, that's my advisor. He was uh, Uli Walter. He became my advisor later on, and I stayed at Purdue. Okay, so this naturally led to teaching college for employment because the grad school, you, you can teach classes, you can get the government to pay for your school, or the government charges you for the school too, but anyway, so uh, and so I would have a lot of teaching skills, so whenever it came time to get a job, it was just kind of very easy to get a teaching job, and you know, math's in very much in demand, and teaching college is a nice job, okay, don't let me think, don't let me think that, don't think that I told you something else, it's a very nice job, you get to sit in the office, and you get to talk to people, and you get to think and read books, you know, <laughs> I mean, What's, what's, what, what's not to love about that? So, uh, but there is a, 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 a thing about when you, but just when you teach in general, that you're in a, usually in a college or some type of institution that's a bureaucracy, and the bureaucracy does take away from the teaching aspect of it. And, and uh, bureaucracy in education is, is something that, at least in my uh, experience, grows. So uh, that's something that, uh, and I don't think that's going to end anytime soon. You, as, as, as more people come, more students come with financial aid, the financial aid comes with a lot of strings, uh, then they keep passing more uh, rules about ADA and other things, which um, I think that most professors probably, probably can handle on their own, but with all the regulations, there's a very specific procedure that can take away from flexibility a little bit. Okay, some common, uh, common teaching experience that I had teaching math is that, well, many students that come to college, they uh, struggle with math. Uh, they, you know, that's, uh, that was my experience. There's, I mean, there's a lot of different class uh, math courses, of course, you know, I, I, there's some calculus courses where you're going to find the better students, and then there's the algebra courses that are really, at, at a high school level, they're not much above. Uh, they started calling them developmental algebra courses, but when I went through, they were called remedial algebra courses. Uh, and, and I've even been in a college where they were thinking of making a remedial math algebra for the remedial algebra class. And so that's, that's, what's, that's been uh, an experience that's very common. And uh, while all this was going on, I had an interesting observation that I made was from a homeschooler in my class, you know, just teaching. 
college, and sometimes homeschoolers want to go to college, and she's in my class. And if you are homeschooled and you go to college, I would actually recommend not telling anybody in the college. I mean, other than getting your application in and all that stuff. It's, I mean, it gets around the, the professors will talk behind the scenes. And it's really not relevant for your education. Uh, but the fact I knew that this student was a homeschooler uh, was it just made her behavior, uh, it just made me think about her behavior. So what I noticed with her was, you know, I just went about my day teaching, and here's how, okay, we solve this equation, blah, blah, blah. And then I got a hey, wait from the homeschooler, and she'd ask a question, which is exactly what you want a student to do, you know, when you're teaching, right? That helps me. That's a feedback. That's very good feedback. If you're ever a student, definitely ask questions. That's exactly what she was. That's what she. That's exactly what she did. She asked a question, and then I went and explained, like I went into more detail on that problem, and and so her result, her reaction was, oh, and that's pretty much what her reaction was, and that went on, but it was just like, oh, I got it. Now what's unusual? about that is that uh, usually, uh, often, what I, who would I even imagine as public school students, I would go into more detail and I'd get not an oh, but a confused expression, possibly another question, you know, things like that. So uh, that's what was happening with this homeschooler. Uh, event, and eventually she, she kept asking questions. Eventually she asked something a little bit, what I thought was below the level of course, like any good teacher, I invited her to my office and. She actually came, took me up on invitation. Ta I talked with her for an hour and, uh, in my office, and we just went through like all the basics and all that. And then I think for the rest of the term, she really didn't have any questions anymore. What I suspect happened is that homeschooler didn't have any exposure to algebra. Not having any exposure to algebra, when it was time to learn it, they learned it. <laughs> That's, but, when they, but compare that to public school students, when it's time to learn it, they don't learn it. They they are they have a very high anxiety level. So uh, so this leads to the question: Are public schools successful? That's that's really a question that should be asked uh, in the broader community. Like I mean, in the in the human community, are public schools successful? And uh, from this experience, a takeaway. Now, this is no need. This is not a scientific study, but it's only anecdotal. But uh, no exposure to algebra may be better than what public school, school than what public schools expose students to. That that was kind of the takeaway. This is, so now I have a hypothesis. As somebody with a physics degree, like okay, now I have a hypothesis. Maybe no exposure to algebra is better than what public schools do. So the hypothesis was that public schools don't really encourage math education. Okay, so this title is hard to read. It says imagine math education without government. Uh, involvement. So uh, let's imagine math education. So that's something that I, I had been doing before, you know, just in general, because as I became less uh, enthusiastic about the government, I wanted to know what my profession would be like if it was more free or unencumbered or didn't have all the government money involved in it. So that's something I would think. So I, I came up with some tenets, and this is not exhaustive by any means, only 20 minutes, uh, but I think math education should not be teacher-centered. So that means probably it should be student-centered. Right? And um, I think math education should actually encourage creativity. Uh, there's a limit to how creative you can be with math, but I think where you can bring creativity in, you should certainly do this. And then the last bullet point is a big deal. Math should not be a source of anxiety. It's a subject. It doesn't go around and stalk you at night, break into your home, and you know, I, I tell my students, math problems are the best problems, right? The math problems are better than boyfriend, girlfriend problems, they're better family problems, they're better health problems, better money problems. You, I'd rather have a math problem any old day. In fact, math problems can help you solve the money problems. Anyway, so as a consequence, if you actually wanted to develop an, an anxiety-free curriculum, I think you must not have any tests and you must not have any grades. Okay, so that's one takeaway from that. I, I think if with, gov with less government influence, uh, you might see less grades and less tests. 
Okay? For example, some a piano lesson. Right? Somebody plays piano, they don't get grades. They go they go there once a week maybe and they go home, they practice, and you know how they're doing based on how they play. You don't need a test, you don't need a grade. Recital, okay? I think that's more what a market uh, system would uh, tend towards. Uh, so now let me just clarify. So I'm claiming no tests and grades. I'm just kind of wanting, I'm just promoting that for young people, okay? When you're young, have fun, grow, learn. You don't need a test or a grade. At some point, grades may be appropriate. And uh, if I had to kind of clarify a position, I might say that I would wait till about 14 years of age before uh, giving grades and tests. But mainly I would start doing that because the student may want to go to college and if you don't give them the test taking skill before college, you're probably doing them a disservice. And I also think four years is enough time to teach them the test taking skill, right? So that, that's kind of my reasoning on that. All right, so uh, good. So, so and then certainly a student levels can be obsessed without the test. So that led to the birth of what I'm calling Dr. Tapp's Geometric Playground. And um, so this is a, a, an example of a result uh, of the playground. It's uh, gumdrops and toothpicks. Um, that uh, the, the, what I'm trying to teach is about platonic solids. And uh, so they play with their gumdrops and toothpicks. So the foreground is, I believe this was called the Statue of Liberty. Uh, I didn't see it, but uh, my, my uh, housemate, who's an adult, did see a Statue of Liberty in that. But this was also very interesting, because, like, for example, a platonic solid is a cube. And so they built a cube, you know, seven-year-olds built a cube, and then they kept going, and they built a three-dimensional lattice, right? Which I would, when I'm developing curriculum, I won't say, okay, I'm going to teach you about three-dimensional lattices. It's just kind of let them do what they want to do, and then, I'll, then when this happens, you say, oh, wow, that's a three-dimensional lab, right? <laughs> because now they're interested in it. It's not like some abstraction you're bringing apart. And so this is an example of evaluating a student uh, before this. And, and these uh, slides might not show with the lighting and everything, but uh, there's four months difference between here and uh, like this one thing so it has simple problems like two times six equals 12. There's actually a mistake, 12 plus 88. It's, they, they, they answered nine, 10. They didn't carry their one right, but they crossed that out and wrote 100, so they figured it out. Um, and this was, that on the left, that was actually done at home, and I didn't assign it. And I didn't, and she made up those questions, and, which I think is a big deal. By having them make up a question, they have a stake in it more than if I just give them a sheet with a bunch of questions. Okay, so after four months, this is what happened. And now at the top, we're adding three-digit three numbers. Uh, I helped her with the first row. She actually did the second row. She told me what numbers she wanted to add. I wrote those down, and then for the second row, I just added, I just handed her the pen, and she went to town. That was it. And also notice that both of them say I love math, <laughs> right? So I, that, I mean, as far as, Reducing math anxiety, I think of have done it in this case, right? I love math, that's not anxiety, right? So, uh, so the, now, pictures don't express everything. I mean, they say pictures are worth a thousand words, but there's all kinds of subtle, subtle things that go on when I teach that, uh, that I think make a really huge difference. Uh, so some things that might not be uh, explicit in the picture is this work is student motivated, the student kind of initiates this, uh, I only meet the students once a week, and that's pretty key, right? So to get, you know, with with a five day a week learning arithmetic, right? If you've had trouble with it one day, and you're going back the exact name the next day, and you're having trouble with it again, it, what? What? You know, if you at least have a week between where there's a reprieve and you had trouble, now you go, oh, and then you predict, then I would present it a different way. I wouldn't do it exactly the same. So uh, that, that's one reason, I think that's a one, a sort, possibly one source of anxiety, right? You don't have to worry about it for another week. Uh, also think about, and also think about this for bang for bucket. We had schools where, you like elementary school kids went to school twice a week, think how much cheaper it would be. And if you could get better results at twice a week, wouldn't you? 
right? Wouldn't you want your kids to do better, even if it took less time? I don't encourage rote memorization. Uh, I don't really discourage it either. I just structure activities where there's no rote memorization. And there's much more, but only seconds to flip through it now. Uh, when, I'm, I, when I was preparing this, I think I have a little bit more time than what I expected. But uh, here's, uh, it's, here's a picture of some of the work they were doing. Uh, this, so I have these activities planned out. So this is an example of Pascal's triangle. And uh, so what Pascal's triangle is is a bunch of numbers, okay? And you come up with the row below the row. You, you have a row, and you come up with the lower row by adding the two numbers above it, right? So like in the middle of two numbers, you just add them and write the result. And uh, so this is something that I believe seven-year-olds can do because the only thing that you need to do is addition, okay? But Pascal's triangle is very important in other branches of mathematics. It's actually very important in combinatorics. So I haven't really, well, and this is an example where I did teach some combinatorics. Since, anyway, so combinatorics is a word, it means the science of counting. And why wouldn't you want to teach seven-year-olds how to count? Okay, but uh, I mean, some problems can get kind of difficult in combinatorics, like the number. If you have a club with seven people, what's the, what's the number of ways you can elect the president, vice president, and secretary? Right? It's seven times six times five. But anyway, so uh, so they were doing this, and then I, I circled the ten there, and uh, I had five colors. Uh, we had all these blocks to play with, and so I took five different colors and had to pick them. And, uh, and uh, we cho chose two colors out of the five, and so there's ten ways to do that. So that's like showing them the combinatorics there. Right, and I'm not testing this. That's the thing, you can do a lot when you don't have to worry about a test. And then they kept going. Uh, one thing that's really interesting with this is uh, that because they, they're using the marker board here, this is another one of those subtle things. I have them use the marker board, so me use the marker board. And they get, they're so much more involved that way. Instead of just like, oh, they're using their paper and I'm using the marker board. That's the teacher board, right? Now, forget that. So, uh, and, and then, then an unintended consequence is uh, they all have different colored markers. So when I take this picture and I look at it later, I know who did what. Blue was Ainsley, red was Delaney, and green was Ava. Okay, so I, I kind of have a, an assessment. Now, if Ava got tired, she started doing math over here. And uh, she, I gave her that calculator, and she just, because she was tired with the Pascal's triangle, she, but she typed things in, and she actually wrote in, down the results there as a result of the calculator. That's another thing I've learned, is I think technology should be embraced when you're teaching, because you're going to be raising these kids to be in a technological world no matter what. I still want them to be able to add without the reliance on technology, but to to, uh, to uh, force them not to have it is kind of ridiculous. But when you don't test, it becomes very fluid. You're like, oh, let's not use one now. They don't, they're not worried because they're not going to get a grade. Anyway, it just like everything works together when you uh, change the, your approach this way. And so here's a Pascal's triangle that was a little bit later. And this was like several months later. This was not the planned activity. This was just simply a seven-year-old grabbing my arm and saying, can we do Pascal's triangle? But yes, we can do Pascal's right. Okay, so she got some more practice addition. I did help her at the end, and in this one, I really did help them a lot towards the end. They got trouble with, they had trouble once I get the three digits, but Ainsley was really excited. She's like, can we do another? Can we do another? So anyway, uh, here's an example of a multiplication table, and using the multiplication, again, having them use the board. Uh, you can see how they got tired around six times seven, and they stopped also, the board's not ideal for their size because it was hard for them to reach, but they really did get tired. They didn't, uh, I, I would have flipped it around if they wanted to continue. And then, you know, a month later, two months later, uh, I have this, the same students do this and they filled in the multiplication table from scratch. And this is part of the not non rote thing. Having them fill it in is not rote memorization. I'm not handing it to them and say memorize it. But how do we fill it in? It took about half an hour, like to help her a little bit. Uh, but once I explained that you could use the several digit addition to help, she actually did that hard corner all by herself because she could just keep doing the uh, multi digit addition. I have her use scrap paper at home. 
Okay, and then here is, so uh, I call these art selfies, you know it's the title of art self, or math selfies, okay? That's what I call these, math selfies. And so I call that art selfie, but one thing, I was just taking pictures so I could like tell you what I'm doing and show them, but uh, I actually had Laney come up and want me to take a picture of this. And I think picture taking can be incorporated into a curriculum or a teaching method because it really motivates the student to, they're like, oh, they like my work, they want to take a picture of it, right? So now I'm going to be taking pictures whether I want to show it to people or not just because it it's shows an interest, a level of interest. Uh, and it's cheap <laughs> with with technology and everything. It's pretty practically free. It's, it's amazing, right? Why wouldn't you do it? It's free. And they get all excited and happy to have their picture taken. So in the future, I'm hoping to develop an algebra curriculum. I'm still researching into that. There's this uh, guy, I think his name is Lee Moore, Richard Lee Moore, or something like that. Uh, so he developed the Moore method. So I'm, I'm trying to incorporate the, right, that method into a basically an algebra level course. I don't think it would be appropriate for seven year olds, but as they grow, it would be nice to have something that can be delivered to them that's at their appropriate level. And so that's, uh, are there any questions? We have one minute for questions. Are there, is there a question? Just speak out loud. How old are these children? Right now with this playground, I've been targeting it to six, seven, and eight year olds. Um, after, now that I have some experience, I might go to seven, eight, nine, or something like that. Are you like doing this in Hampshire? Yeah, I'm doing this in Fort Smith at the Braxium oh, okay. um, every Tuesday at 10 o'clock. Um, yeah, uh, first drop in's free. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I'm doing it in Fort Smith. Uh, and also, I'm scheduled to join in with an existing homeschool program uh, in Manchester. Uh, it's a Mosaic Explorer program. And if six students sign up for their six, if parents sign up six students for that, uh, then it will run. And I'll be doing it in Manchester as well. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, do we have time for another question? Uh, yeah, I would think so. One more question. Sure. sure. Gordon, yeah, Mike. I can just make a personal attestation. If you can, but if you use a mic. <laughs> um, so I, I operate the Praxium with uh, some partners and just. Um, I've, I've been watching uh, intently as we, this is, Darren's kind of jive with the kind of programming that we want to have at the Praxium and, and watching what he's doing in real time, I can just tell you that uh, it seems to be working really well. Uh, the kids are looking forward to the class, new kids are joining. Um, I'm one of the people that has math anxiety from my educational experience um, and I don't know some of the stuff that he's teaching the six to eight year olds. Uh, but I really, I, I think what he's doing is really great, and there's definitely... Go to the class! What's that? Go to the class! I, I might. <laughs> I might. I might eat all the gumdrops, though. It's really terrible. Uh, so yeah, he's doing, it, it, there's definitely some value in this. I tell you, I tell him to not eat the gumdrops till the end, because I'll give him clean ones. So, <laughs> yeah. so I can become, you got to wait till the end. Yeah, I'll read you think the math anxiety comes from because I see kids playing sports and you know they're shooting hoops. I don't see any anxiety. Like they're not afraid they're gonna miss, but then when I'm a teacher too, when it comes time to solve a problem, are they really nervous or what is So the the question is where does the math anxiety come from? Yeah. I suspect it's I don't really know, but I suspect it's the quizzes, uh, it's the tests and it's the grades. It's the tests and the grades. I, I was not making good grades in middle school, high school uh, I started making honor roll junior year, but I flunked out of eighth grade. I mean, and I think the reason I don't have math anxiety is because I didn't care that I flunked out uh, of eighth grade. Um, like my mom cared. She cried and I didn't get to go on vacation that year, but I was having a great time staying with my grandmother. Uh, and uh, so I think somehow I was special because I didn't really care about their letters on paper. So I just, and then like when I, when I did the homework, math homework, I did the first few, I did the last few that were the hardest, and then I turned it around and made up some harder ones, and did those, and then turned it in, and I flunked. <laughs> Can I get in one thing to that? I, I'm a teacher as well. Um, yes. One thing that I think happens, especially with math, because everything builds on what happened prior to that, on, uh, I mean, English or history maybe to, uh, a little 
bit much less extent though. If you have a student who has one teacher one year who's not doing a good job, now they're behind. Now they go into the next class and they're a student who's used to doing well at things and all of a sudden, I don't get this, I'm not good at math, and it becomes ingrained in them and it becomes difficult. I've seen that happen many times. And the grades would reinforce, I'm not good. Josh? Yeah, do you think this would be a gap in the internet, or is it something that's uh, the, the question is, do I think this could be adapted for the internet? I think it could be, but um, I, I think it needs to be adapted in a way that involves a parent. Uh, so there would be a learning curve on the parents. What about just with friends, or do you think it could help parents learn well? I think an adult to get the ball rolling would be very helpful. I really do. Uh, and I think once a week is, is I'm actually, well, first I did once a week because I've I'm, I'm, I'm got day jobs and all that. But now I'm actually recommending once a week for pedagogical reasons. Like actually good, it's good for teaching this stuff. Like I mean, algebra is going to probably be two, three times a week. I think it's more that idea is once a week that really cuts down the resources you need. Uh, uh, I think it could be adapted. I don't know how. So, all right, Mr.